Something strange is impacting supply lines in the lands between. Normally, as an American, when a problem impacts other people, I don't care. But when it affects me, well, now there's a problem. And Tarnish Mart has stopped sending me my supply of perfectly legal substance. Someone's gotta fix this, but because of supply issues, I can only use items I can craft or obtain from independent retailers. And my hands are so small, so there's a limit to how many items I can use. Can I take my rightful place as Elden Lord before running out of consumables? I had to go with Smeagol on this one because is there anyone better suited to throw random garbage at strangers in search of a ring? First we start off by collecting every single possible thing in this whole game. That's an exaggeration, but I don't know, is it? We're gonna need about 26 cookbooks, 20 crack pots, 8 crystal tears, 10 ritual pots, 10 perfume bottles, 9 or so talismans, 55 burgers, 55 fries, 55 tacos. I'm just kidding, but it's a lot. Specifically before Margaret, we grabbed a total of 9 different cookbooks. The Physic Flask, along with the Faith, Strength, Dex, and Int crystal tears. Flame Grammy Strength, Commander Standard, Jellyfish Shield, and the two Dectus halves for easy access to Altus. Now, there's a lot in Altus, but we're just concerned with the Perfumer's Paraphernalia. In the Shaded Castle, there are a bunch of sellable items like Golden Runes and Smithing Stones, but more importantly, you can find a Perfume Bottle and the Perfumer's Cookbook number 2, letting us craft the Blood Boil and Poison Spray Mist Aromatics. Two very strong perfumes. To the southeast lies the Perfumer's Ruins, containing two more Perfume Bottles, another Cookbook, letting us craft Spark, and a talisman that boosts our spark damage by 20%. The last thing we would need is Miranda Powder, a key ingredient for both spark and poison spray mist, and six of these are found in Perfumer's Grotto, along with one more perfume bottle. Alright, now we can challenge the first boss. Buffs for Margaret were pretty simple. I didn't have the fire tier yet, so this was just strength and dex, followed by commander standard, flame grant me strength, and then jellyfish. And you can see just how much of a noob I am here. I mean, really? Jellyfish shield before even entering the arena? Standard before flame? What is going on? My consumable of choice was Spark Aromatic, and if you know anything about Spark, you'll know this was a huge mistake. But wow, look at that damage. Margaret ended up taking five Sparks to finish, which means for the rest of the playthrough, I would only have five left, and no more. Before fighting Godric, we were going to have to grab some crack pots. We can get a total of 18 right now. Three can be chosen as your keepsake. Two can be found to the left of the secluded cell bonfire in a corner behind some living jars. Five can be purchased. Three from Kale and two from various nomadic merchants in Weaving Peninsula and Kaled. An additional three in Jarburg, where you can visit Mr. Bairn. There's one sitting on this extended tree branch in Kaled, one found in Groveside Cave, one in Caria Manor. And the final two, that we can obtain right now at least, are in hands down the worst mini dungeon in the game, the Azurna side tomb. Now normally there are four here, but since I chose the pot keepsake, it removes two from this area. While you're here, you should also grab the two ritual pots so that you never, ever have to come back. Something else I'll mention is that between poison stones, pots, clumps, and poison daggers, there's nearly 100 instances of poison blood up that I've access to, which is a lot. And due to the way status effects work, it's pretty efficient to use them on just about every boss you can. So I wiped out this Kaled Merchant's inventory and paired the poison with fire pots just because they're easy to get right now. Buffs are the same as the market fight, and this guy, man, he's the slowest jump in the whole game. But the minute I do consumables only, he suddenly enters the matrix and dodges three of my attacks. With those unfortunate setbacks, this fight took 11 fire pots and 6 poison stones. Much more than I expected, and I knew it was only going to get worse from here. So, I had a thought. What if there was a calculator that took the boss's health and divided it by the base damage of consumables, thus giving me the exact number of each item I would need for each boss? Now, I don't know how to do this, but I knew something that might. I gave it some very simple instructions, and it produced a working but simple calculator. So I asked chat to add some functionality. Could this be modified to include buffs? What if I wanted to choose the amount of each consumable? It was even able to help me diagnose issues that I ran into. After about half an hour and a plate full of nachos, I was left with this. In these columns, I have all 12 required bosses with their corresponding health values. Here I have the weapons I'm using and their corresponding base damages. Here are common buff patterns, which includes things like Jellyfish Shield, Standard Golden Vow, stuff like that. Over here, I don't know what the heck this is, but it's highlighted, so I ain't touching that. And finally, here's the amount of consumables that I would need to beat each required boss. So let's say I wanted to beat Godric with fire pods. Normally it would be 22, but with a standard buff pattern, it would be, huh, 11. Okay, enough of that. Radon was next, and this run very quickly went from Candyland to the Eldritch Horror version. 
I'm positively allergic to winning against this guy, so I was going to need a plan. First, I went to Kayla to cheese some runes from this horsey, and it didn't work. But then it did. But then I didn't get my runes. But then I did, so that worked out. I also, of course, had to grab the best great rune in the game from Stormbolt Castle. Then I went to the RLACC, and if you're in the club, you know that stands for Rhea Lucaria Academy Crystal Cave, but you didn't, so <clears throat> loser. Here I used Gravity Stone chunks that I got from Gale Tunnel to take on the Academy Crystal Kids. Even with my limited knowledge, I knew gravity items were pretty ass, and there was a ton of magic damage goodies, so I figured grabbing Terra Magica would be worth it. Next stop was to visit the Sealed Tunnel for the Smithing Stone Bell Bearing 2, allowing for the purchase of Explosive Stones, which I used to take down the Erdtree Avatar in Lyurnia, for the magic, lightning, and holy crack tears. And yes, I even used consumables for invisible walls. I also made a pit stop to pick up Halish Abrivi, then finally into some caves to find some large glintstone scraps. With those tools, I was ready to enact my plan. Step one was to run away as a coward would, therefore de-aggroing Radon and forcing him to use his melee weapon. This might confuse some of you, but after all, what is a bow if not a ranged sword? Step two, while Radon makes his transcontinental journey, I would buff and deal as much damage as possible with large glint scraps and magic pots. This worked great. I got him down to half health just as Terra Magic ran out. Step three was to poison Radon and once again, run away like a coward. Any additional damage necessary would be dealt with Kukri's and magic pots from afar. Now, you might take issue with this strategy as it employs a disproportionate amount of cowardice. Mmm, yes, that's true. Once the fight was over, I spoke with Alexander to further the Jar Baron quest, and headed towards Seathwater Terminus to speak with Alex again for the Jarhead armor, which gives us a nice little 10% increase to pot damage. You should also pick up any Volcano Stones you can on the way here. I think from like one run, I got 73 of them, so you should be good to go. Rodan's death, of course, lets you progress around his questline, but first we need Loretta out of the way. Here I chose Sacred Order Pots, mostly because they're not very good endgame, and whoops, I missed one pot, no two, for absolutely no reason at all. I just didn't lock on. Still, they did way more damage than I expected, and in total, I used six Sacred Order Pots. Finally, I could speak with Ronnie. I need you to get my blade from Nocron. Can't Blythe do it? What was that? Well, no, I mean, it's, he's literally already down there, isn't he? You better get your ass into that crater, or I swear to God if you think what happened to Godwin was bad. All right, I'm going. So we headed into Nokron to take on our biggest challenge yet. My own inner demon. Okay. Yeah, he's pretty shit. Then I got absolutely from softed. Yeah, that was a wall, buddy. But we get back up to grab the missionary cookbook number five, and a bit further down we can grab the Finger Slayer Blade. Then to Old Palace for some very important human bone shards. There are some other random goodies scattered in this area, but the most important by far is found in the Lake of Rot, to the far back right corner hidden in this standalone temple, the Nomadic Warriors Cookbook 22, aka Rot Pots. Then a slight jaunt around this corridor to get T-posed on, drop down to this merchant who sells gravity chunks and fans, as well as the Perfumer's Cookbook number 4. And back on the surface, if you put your best dancing shoes on and do a little two-step, Anastasia will fall head over heels for you right off this cliff, netting you the Sacred Scorpion Charm. Our next area of interest would be Landell, and of course, Draconic stood in our way. It took me a while to find the best strategy for this fight, but the winning ticket ended up being a combination of Magic Pots and Sacred Order Pots. I may have underestimated them earlier. I said they were pretty mid, but they clapped Loretta, and they're kind of clapping this guy. Four magic and four sacred order pots got him down to about 25% health. Then I just poisoned him with pots and clumps, and bada bing. In Lindell, we can grab our seventh perfume bottle, our 19th cracked pot, and 10 Miranda powders, which we need for spark aromatics or poison spray mist. Little side note, I'd love it if any future DLCs give us more insight into perfumers. I've always thought they were neat. They can use spark aromatics, can cast a protection spell like the opaline bubble tear, seemingly at will, and they developed a poison that is acutely stronger than even Scarlet Rot. I don't know. I think they're cool. Anyways, there are a few things to do before Godfrey Shade, like grabbing the lightning and fire scorpion charms. I also picked up a few Aeonian butterflies from Kaelid. Lightning is the obvious play for Godfrey Shade, and my GPT calc said I would need about 8 of them, so let's see how accurate we are.
I would have loved it if every subsequent fight was as easy as that one was, but we're getting into the big leagues now, and Morgoth stands as a metaphorical bridge between the early game bosses and the late game bosses. I could no longer just wander into these boss arenas with whatever trousers I happen to be wearing. So I backtracked a bit to carry a manor to visit our friend Pidia. Oh, please. Unfortunately, by the time we got there, he was not among the living. But no worries, we can grab his bell bearing, give it to the Maiden Husks, and purchase a Ritual Pot and three Old Fangs, which are required for Redmain Fire Pots. You can find an additional 15 Old Fangs spread across three locations. Pidia's Roof, the Explody Cave, and a Final Five in Landell. Back to Rhea Lucaria to subdue the Red Wolf using a combination of Gravity Stone fans and normal daggers. I always love fighting Red Wolf, because its low HP bar makes everything you do look super overpowered. And right outside the boss arena, there's a balcony you can access where our final cracked pot is sitting in the corner. I then had to revisit Kaled for the Star Scourge Talisman in Fort Gale, the Armorer's Cookbook number 4 in Redmain Castle, and then I used four fire pots to fight the Putrid Avatar next to the Minor Urgery for the Shrouding Flamed Cracked Tear. There was one final important task I had to do, which is accessing patches as a merchant. To do this, I would have to beat Bloody Finger, um... If it isn't Narius. Huh, Narius. That's a cool name. Thanks, Yura. Speaking of, I think Yura somehow skipped a few tiers in the Bloody Finger Hunter hierarchy. He technically does hold the title of Bloody Finger Hunter, but I think a more appropriate one would be Bloody Finger Tickler. This guy just doesn't do damage. He probably saved me two explosive stones, which I guess is better than nothing. Once inside the cave, I use the remainder of my explosive stones and a Cuckoo Glintstone to get patches to chill. Then, because I've already been to Volcano Manor, he moves there as a merchant where he sells Picklefoots, Fan Daggers, and Margit's Shackle. My plan for Morgoth was to shackle immediately, then try to stagger him with Volcano Pots, and finish him off with Oil Plus Redman. I haven't really mentioned Oil Pots, but in theory they're supposed to increase the next instance of fire damage by 50%, which seems pretty crazy, but this was consistently not true. It was more like 25% at most. Conceptually, I love the item, but that previous fact combined with the reality that you're wasting precious buff time by throwing a non-damaging consumable means they're kind of bad in practice. But back to the fight. After the initial stagger, we hit him with a couple more Volcano Pots and three more oil plus red band combo meals, and Morgoth was dusted. Once I made it into the mountaintops, I made sure to collect plenty of fire blossoms as they are needed for giant's flame pots, and I lit a few fires for easy access back. Then I wanted a different way to proc bleed than just kukris, so I visited Vare to gain access to Mogwin. The intended way to do this quest is to invade and then defeat Magnus, but I didn't want to waste resources doing that, so I just invaded him, gave him the old dine and dash plus no tip combo thrice, and that satisfies the quest requirements. Then I just had to pick up the only appropriate head armor for Smeagol, and we were in. The whole point in coming here was to obtain the Nomadic Warriors Cookbook 24 and Blood Tainted Excrement for Swarm Pots, but the real treasure in this palace are all of the Chumbo runes that you can get. Something else I would need are regular Glen Scraps, which you can buy from the Maiden Husks after defeating the single Crystallion in the Rhea Lucaria Crystal Tunnel. And finally, to the Plague Church for more Aeonian Butterflies. The arsenal for this fight looks something like Magic, Lightning, Physic, and then as many as I could carry of the following. Glint Scraps, Lightning Pots, Rot Pots, Swarm Pots, Poison Bone Darts, Crystal Darts, Kukris, and some Gravity Stone Chunks. My chat GPT calc said I would only need 37 Lightning Pots, and um, I've got 11, so we're in good shape. We can borrow a strategy from the Radon fight and cheese the start of this fight by abusing the absurd range of Glint Scraps. About 7 of them should break his anklet and do some nice chip damage. After that, there were no more freebies, we just had to get in there. And even though my lightning pot showed up in a big way, dealing nearly 1500 damage a pop, Fire Giant was still looking pretty healthy. Poison would deal about 6% of his health, and a few crystal darts would knock him into phase 2. Here, 40% of all the rot bots I would ever have were used to rot him, and then I tossed some swarm pots at him, which I'm convinced do nothing. The rest of this fight was mainly me trying to avoid getting one shot and occasionally throwing a kukri or crystal dart his way. Rot carried this fight pretty hard. The final tally for this fight was 11 lightning pots, 4 rot, 5 swarm, 10 glint scraps, 9 kukris, 18 poison bone darts, and 16 crystal darts. With that, I breathed a sigh of relief as we headed into Faramazula. 
My best bet against the godskins was going to be magic damage, but I didn't have many magic pots left. Luckily, there's an upgraded version of magic pots called Academy Magic Pots, which you can craft after picking up a cookbook in the consecrated snowfields. To get there, we would of course have to use the Grand Lift of Rold, which requires both halves of the secret Halotree Medallion. The right half is given to us by, um, Bungo? I don't know what this guy's name is. And the left half is atop Castle Soul being guarded by Commander Nile, who isn't quite as eager to give up his half as Bungo was. This is always a tough fight, mainly due to Nile's ability to summon two Banished Knights, Oleg and some other guy. There's a very interesting item in the game called a Bewitching Branch that allows you to turn some enemies into allies, and it works here. If you sprint towards Nile as soon as you enter the boss fog and poke Oleg right as he's being summoned, he'll turn against his friends. But he does have a bad habit of getting one shot and sometimes will attack the other summon. To fix this, if you bewitch Oleg and immediately run to the left, the other knight will usually aggro to you, placing the other two in a 1v1. If you get lucky, Oleg can take Nile down to about half health. It's pretty nuts. But once Nile is in his range, he phase transitions, and now you just have a more difficult fight with no time to buff. I eventually found that the best strategy was to charm Oleg and actually hope he dies after dealing about 2 to 3,000 damage. Then charm the other banished knight, buff, and start blasting Nile with consumables. Even with all that prep work, I just barely won in a trade. Now we can get our hands on the left half of the Halotree Medallion. I also figured I should grab our last two ritual pots. One is found in the sewers of Landell just before Moog, and the other is found in the second worst mini dungeon, the Giant's Catacombs. Finally, I went through the Carrion Study Hall for the Stargazer Heirloom. Alright, let me summarize the plan for this fight. First, we're going to sleep the God Twins close together, but not too close because we need a little bit of room to throw our pots. Then we're going to throw our poison and rot pots, but make sure not to hit them as that would wake them up. Also, definitely don't cast Hallow Shabriri right next to them because that shit does damage and will wake them up. Then we go through our buffing process, freezing pot to lower their defense, and then blast him with a few Academy Magic pots, and we're golden. And then we have to do all of that all over again. The second round wasn't quite as elegant, and I didn't get them close enough together, but the rot still procced and I dealt enough damage with freezing and academy magic bots that I was able to finish the fight with crystal darts. Let's talk about the Dialos quest line real quick. At the end of this quest, you can receive a talisman that boosts your pot damage by 20%. Considering I'm using mainly bots, I want that talisman. But this quest is perplexing. It's not at all clear that Dialos is even related to the Jar Baron quest, and the way to progress each questline is a mystery. Which is a shame, because content-wise, this is a good quest. Dialos is a very relatable guy. He's someone who is struggling to find his place in the world, beset with the weight of an overbearing family name. The tale of House Hoslo is told in blood, after all. And he's got a great redemption arc. Well, kind of. But the entire time, I felt like I was on the We Want Plates subreddit, where the main dish might be great, but the way it was presented left me scratching my head. So what ended up working for me was doing all the early game stuff, like talking to Dialos at the round table and again at Lyurnia, speaking with Alex after Radon and in Zeethwater. During that time, I made sure to visit Jar Baron a lot. Then I defeated God Twins and did the final fight against Alexander. This gave me his innards, which I took back to Jarberg, and nothing. So I went back to Volcano Manor and did the first two assassination requests in a couple of fights that were both very fun and engaging. Thank God I didn't have to deal with the Chad brother, Juno Hoslo. Once I did that, Dialis moves back to Jarberg and unfortunately dies in vain. And after all that, you can give Alexander's innards to Jar Baron, who will then leave, and in his place you can find the Jar Talisman. Oh boy, time for Malekith. This fight was very frustrating, and on paper, it shouldn't have been. Malekith has a total of about 10,000 health, but really it's half that because he shares his HP pool with Gurank, and Gurank is barely a fight. Really, all I've got to do is take out about 5k health, which should be a breeze considering we only recently took down the 40,000 of Fire Giant. Anyways, the plan was to use Ranker Pots for Gurank because both the item and the boss are equally terrible, 
and then rely heavily on poison and rot for Malekith. The Gurring part went fine, but Malekith wasn't so easy. His constant dodging and barrage of attacks made hitting him with pots pretty difficult, and even when I could get a pot in, they would often just miss, which would force me to reset the fight. Eventually, I found a way to no-scope his ass while he was backflipping over me during the initial phase change, and what game are we playing again? Then I needed to poison him, which was made much easier with poison bone darts. Rot plus poison would end up doing about 4500 damage, just nearly killing him. Get him, please, just, just, oh! This, what happens if this cougar doesn't kill him, dude? Huh? Yeah! Oh! Holy shit! Man, am I glad I brought that kukri in there. Smooth sailing from here? Mm-hmm. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Whatever you say. Smooth sailing indeed. If I just quit right now and didn't do anything else. But Gideon was next, and I still had no plan. I knew leveling up a few times would increase my chances of whatever I would be doing, so I crafted some holy water pots and made my way into Azurna's Hero's Grave to grab a weapon called Golden Epitaph. The reason these two things are important is because they have a certified bonkers damage multiplier against undead enemies. It just so happens there are two late game enemies that drop a considerable amount of runes and are also undead. The first is a stone's throw away from Castle Soul. <laughs> Wow. I missed two buffs, and it still killed it in two pots. That's insane. And the second is in a place I realize I've never been before, deep within the consecrated snowfield. He's like, is he aiming for me, or is it always the same spot? No, he's definitely aiming for me. This person's alive. How have I never... What is going on? Run in. Attack. Okay. Pickle. Did I get it off? Uh, I did. These excursions yielded me about three levels, and at this point, everything helps. Earlier, I mentioned being super worried about Gideon. This guy was going to dodge literally everything. Lucky for me, the Elden Ring deity himself, Gino, put out this video as I was brainstorming on how to beat Gideon, and um, he's a genius. There is one Frenzy Flame Stone that you can get just in the open world. You can craft them as well, but that requires defeating Sewer Moog. Then you just need a hard-hitting consumable. Gino used Spark, so I'll be doing that as well. What you gotta do is buff, then run up while Gideon is monologuing about how the Oak Tarnished Mob is trying to upset the proper order of things or whatever. Then place your Frenzy Flame Stone down right in front of him, hit a buff, and start blasting him. I also oiled him up, which was overkill. But hey, better safe than sorry. Also check out Gino's channel. He's absolutely cracked at this game. Next was Godfrey, and we only needed to grab one item, which is the Ancient Dragon Apostles Cookbook number 4, found deep within Faramazula. Sometimes when I was prepping for these fights, it felt like I was ordering sushi. Mm, I'll try Academy Magic. Ancient Dragon sounds good. You gotta go Volcano. GPT Calc said 13 Ancient Dragon Pots was the magic number. Now, we've only got 10, but that's fine. We can supplement the rest of the damage needed with whatever else we have lying around. Honestly, I kind of wish Godfrey was a bit more challenging. He's one of my favorites in the Elden Ring cast, but for being an Elden Lord, there's no sense of trepidation. He's kind of just that small hurdle between Gideon and Radagon. First phase was easy peasy. In the second phase, I got hit by the longest range grab I've ever seen. Oh, you see that reach? What is that range? Are you, are you out of your mind? Well, there's a freebie. But he didn't one-shot me, and after a few more pot throws, Mr. Lou was poisoned. The poison ended up not doing as much damage as I thought it would do, but that's okay, we have our dagger contingency plan. And yet again, I am pleasantly surprised by the amount of damage they do. Seven crystal darts, four kukris, and 19 daggers were enough to finish the fight. Whilst prepping for the final fight, I may have stumbled into a conspiracy. Do you notice a common thread between these three images? That's right, it's rope. There is a whole series of consumables that I haven't used in this playthrough called Roped Pots, which are the cousin to their throwable counterparts. 
It's not that I didn't want to use them, or that they're useless. It's because rope, or string, as the game calls it, is impossible to find. In fact, the only way to find string is by murdering demi-humans by the hundreds. Just how many demi-humans does this single barrel represent? Is the CIA involved? Maybe. The FBI? Most definitely. All I know for sure is that George has some explaining to do. There is one place you can find string in the open world, in the Aldous Plateau, on a roof, on a corpse. We would need two more items before the Radagon EB fight. The first is a land octopus ovary for the blood boil milkshake, and the second is located in Hyrule Cave, where I defeated the guardian golem for the blue dancer charm. The setup for Radagon was my remaining two sparks, and as many Redmain Fire, Giant Slam, and Normal Fire Pots as I could carry. For EB, I was counting mostly on Fan Daggers. Talismans were Rad Sword Seal, Dex Heirloom, Jar, and Fire Charm, two of which we would hot swap later with the ones we just picked up. Ratty Boy isn't that hard of a fight, and it's made even easier by getting good RNG. If I opened up with two blasts of Spark, he'd usually follow up with the Bendy Move or the Foot Slammy one, and whichever he didn't do now, he would do next. In this health range, Radagon begins to slam his ham into the ground three times, and the rest of the fight you have to do normally, but it's pretty systematic up until then. During his death animation, hot swap jar for dancer and fire for ritual and hit a buff. Then Lil Sippy and pray for good RNG. I got probably the best I could ask for when Eevee opened up with his four hit melee combo. I was able to get him to half hell before he ran away. And I want to stress, this never happens. Usually, this dude sees me buff, and then sprints to the opposite end of the universe. After that, I just kept getting lucky. This guy would not leave melee range, and I was able to exhaust all of my fan daggers with the Ritual Sword buff active before Elden Stars. Absolutely one of the best RNG runs I've ever had with Elden Beast. And then Elden Stars did Elden Stars things, and almost ruined my whole run. Then I used normal daggers and volcano pots to nearly finish the fight, but decided to do a risky swap to rope fire pots for the BM finish. Here is my tier list, and if you like the video, consider a sub. I have a Chipotle addiction, and I have no money.